Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is very unusual now, uh, so we might have to extend our stay because this is the ethics presentation and it's 60 minutes per the state of North Carolina and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Thanks to Mike Schmidt, we're running a little bit behind and uh, if only he'd put me on that 20 person group of super smart people, maybe I wouldn't have said that, but be that as it may, I'm really glad to introduce our next presentation. It's interesting because it's about a book. It's about a novel. And the novel is called Allegiance. And I'll let the speakers explain it. But uh, one of the classes I teach, it's a small seminar that we teach in my home. It's called... Uh, at the ethical issues of the practice of national security law, uh, because it is different in the national security law environment, ethical issues that arise. And one of our uh, project, one of the books, well, the book that we have to, well, have to read kind of makes it sound less enticing. Uh, one of the books that we have the privilege of reading is Allegiance. And uh, just to set the stage a little bit, it's about from the perspective of a law clerk at the Supreme Court during World War II and during the period of time the Japanese internment cases were involved. I'll turn it over to uh, Professor, I realize now, Peter, I've been pronouncing your name wrong for like 50 years, and, uh, uh, but uh, as my students know, I never get their names right. I just make up a name and <laughs> remind them I was a general and that's gonna be their name. But uh, Peter is uh, one of the foremost authorities, actually, on ethics. He, he writes on many different uh, topics, but ethics from a government lawyer's perspective. He's written a number of things. And, uh, and we're thrilled to have Professor Roosevelt down here from uh, University of Pennsylvania. Now, one of the secrets of my life is that I did apply to the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I am a Villanova Law graduate, <laughs> so you see how well that went. Uh, they told, they said, uh, we already have our guy from St. Joe's, and uh, we don't need another one. So there we, there we have it. Really, uh, <laughs> I, let's just say there's been more than two. No, it's been a great life. Be that as it may, let's let's get started. Let me t turn it over to you, Peter and uh, Hermit, and anxious to hear your analysis. Charlie, thanks very much. I'm delighted to be here as well, and I really appreciate the hospitality that you've shown us and the efficiency that you demonstrate throughout the day in running the conference. As you alluded to, my, my last name is a bit difficult to pronounce. Uh, it's Margulies. It's a German-Jewish name. Uh, that's relevant here because my father is Viennese. In 1938, he decided that being in Vienna was no longer really a good idea since he noticed his fellow Viennese really falling all over themselves when Adolf Hitler showed up one day in the spring. Uh, and seeing the crowds just thrill to Hitler's every word, my father, who is Jewish, of course, said, this is just not really a great idea for me to hang around as much as I like the pastry. And so what I need to do is try to find somewhere else to go. My father ultimately was able to find the city of Shanghai in China. He went there, as did thousands of other refugees. There was a significant refugee community in Shanghai. For the duration of the war, my father stayed in Shanghai for 10 years, from 38 to 48. In 1941, in the course of living in Shanghai, my father became a guest of the Empire of Japan, which took over Shanghai, as it took over much of China, uh, for that period. Uh, my father was not detained by the Japanese, but it was not a, it was not the world's most pleasant experience, although it was surely better than remaining in Vienna. Uh, that's a, a perspective, at least of a kind, on the flip side, which is what happened to Japanese Americans in the United States of America during the period of our entry into World War II. Uh, here, it might be best to invoke our kind of uh, subtext of the day and talk a little bit about Donald Trump. Uh, 
right? Donald Trump uh, had an exchange with Marco Rubio yesterday. Rubio said to Donald Trump, uh, how can you really be equipped to deal with foreign affairs, which you'll have to address as president? After all, the Middle East is not like a real estate deal. Trump responded, well, in a way, it kind of is, right? It's about territory. Uh, I think Trump actually at this particular point had uh, a fair point to raise. Uh, you do have an issue about territory in the Middle East. The Japanese-American internment in the United States of America during World War II was in a lot of ways a real estate issue as well. The United States, in justifying the internment, noted that there were roughly 100,000 Japanese American citizens who were located in various places on the West Coast near factories uh, and other sites that were strategic to uh, war production, and military command. The only problem with that analysis was that Japanese Americans shared that attribute of being close to war production with millions of other American citizens because they lived in the county of Los Angeles and other places or major population centers on the West Coast. Right? That was pretty much the sum total of uh, the actual evidence for the disloyalty of Japanese Americans that justified their detention. The rest was, in essence, made up by the military, by the executive branch, by the Congress, eventually acquiesced in by the courts. So it's a group effort right, by the United States in detaining these folks for about three years. The best single phrase to capture the reasoning involved was, uh, what the Justice Department said in its brief in the Korematsu case, where the Supreme Court ultimately held that the evacuation was lawful. The Justice Department said, we uh, find it necessary to detain uh, this group of 100,000 Japanese Americans because there is an unknown group of unidentified risk to national security within this group that we want to detain. The trouble with that reasoning is you could take a group of 100,000 American citizens of any persuasion uh, and say that it, in that group of 100,000 folks, you'll certainly find some people who will be ready to engage in some kind of law breaking. Do we detain those folks? Typically not, right? But we did detain Japanese Americans in what is in many ways one of the worst episodes in United States history and one of the worst episodes in both the history of the Supreme Court and the history of the Justice Department. Part of it, again, was about real estate because the Japanese had to leave their homes. Often their homes were sold and what amounted to fire sales for pennies on the dollar. Folks gobbled up those properties. So real estate, in a, in a certain way, played a role at that level as well. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Kim to talk a little bit more about the details of the internment and how the litigation started. Um, sure. First, let me, let me thank you all for coming. Let me thank uh, Charlie for inviting me and, and you, Peter, for joining me on this panel. Um, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Um, well, let me say a little bit about what happened, I guess, and then maybe a little bit about why I think it happened, um, and then maybe a little bit about why the story played out the way it did in the courts, um, because that's in large part what, what the book is about. It's about the litigation process and the different players in that process and the different sorts of moral choices and conundrums that they faced. So as Peter said, um, at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack, there's a Japanese and Japanese-American population in the United States of about 127,000. Um, they're concentrated on the West Coast. and it's a population that has had some difficulty assimilating due in large part to racism and suspicion um, from the Caucasian community. And in fact, before Pearl Harbor, people were concerned about possible disloyalty um, in the Japanese American population. And so the Office of Naval Intelligence investigated and the conclusion of that report, the conclusion of that investigation was that while there might be some disloyal members of the community, there was no general problem. There was no sort of 
general racialized disloyalty among the Japanese and Japanese American population. Um, however, after the Pearl Harbor attack, people were very scared. So Americans at that point and Americans now are really not used to being attacked on American soil. Wars we generally experience as things that are fought across the seas. So there's a terrible sense of insecurity. And that feeds into this in two ways, I think, one of which is natural and, and one of which is a little bit more problematic. But the natural one is people, people just get frightened and they start looking around and they generally trust the people who resemble them, who seem more like the real Americans, and they trust the people who don't look like them less, particularly if those people look like the enemy, which the Japanese and Japanese Americans did. Um, and then the other thing that happens, which I, I do think plays a role in this, is the government feels a need to do something. So the government feels a need to demonstrate that it's keeping Americans safe. And one way that you do that, of course, is by fighting the empire of Japan off in the Pacific. But it's also possible to do something very visible at home that reassures the nervous American population. So for various reasons, this pressure to remove Japanese and Japanese Americans from the West Coast starts to build. Um, the general in charge of the Western Defense Command, General John DeWitt, apparently sincerely believes, although this sincere belief isn't part of product of racism and incompetence, but apparently sincerely believes that there is a security threat. Um, there are various special interest groups in California that stand in some way to benefit from removal of the Japanese American population. There are commercial interests like the Salinas Fruit Growers Association who want to get rid of the competition from Japanese farms. Um, there's a group called the Native Sons of the Golden West, which is basically a racist organization that wants to make California white. Um, so there are various people promoting this idea, and there are really not a lot of people pushing back. The Department of Justice is initially very unenthusiastic about the idea of excluding American citizens from the West Coast. The Department of Justice initially says, this is unconstitutional. We won't be a party to it. But eventually it goes forward as more of a military program. The Department of Justice falls in line behind it. Um, FDR's Attorney General, Francis Biddle, who's one of the relatively major characters in Allegiance, because I think of him as sort of a tragic figure in all of this. He's initially opposed. He goes along with it. He ends up thinking he's made a big mistake. Uh, the Department of Justice goes along with it. And so you get this program whereby um, over 100,000 people, most of whom are birthright American citizens, are forced to leave their homes. They're frequently given 24 hours to prepare. They're told, take only what you can carry. They go first to what are called temporary assembly centers, which are places like ra racetracks and fairgrounds, um, still relatively near the coast. And then they're sent to the more permanent relocation centers, which are these camps farther away from the coast, actually scattered relatively widely through the country, some in places like Arkansas. Um, and of course, there are challenges to this because among the Japanese and the Japanese American community, some people actually think this is what our country is asking of us in time of war and this is how we can prove our loyalty because after all, war demands sacrifices. Um, but some people are saying this is unconstitutional and actually by resisting, by standing up for the Constitution, we're rendering the most patriotic service that we can. Um, so you get challenges in court, and that litigation is also a large part of the story of allegiance because some strange things happen. Um, the government cuts some corners. So I don't know how much detail we want to talk about um, these various ethical issues in, and I'm actually Let not an raise, ethical specialist, so I'll, I'll raise you know one the, thing here. the particular rules better than I do. One way of looking at this, this sad episode is it's not just a story about real estate, uh, and a story about bias, because that's really a large part of it, uh, historic animus against Asian Americans in general and Japanese Americans in particular, most notably on the West Coast. Right? But in addition, it's a story, kind of a tale of two lawyers. Right? So one of the lawyers is John McCloy, a very well-known lawyer, uh, sort of a, a paragon uh, of uh, legal competence and respectability in the latter half of the 20th century, one of the models for the lawyer statesman, as is called in Tony Cronin's book, The Lost Lawyer, which is very nostalgic. But McCoy's conduct, in some ways, makes you wonder about whether that nostalgia was justified. 
So McCloy was also the founder of the great New York forum, Milbank Tweed, who became the first uh, U.S. High Commissioner in Germany after World War II, the president of the World Bank, a uh, lawyer for the Rockefellers, uh, in many ways one of the most accomplished lawyers of his day, as Assistant Secretary of War, was also one of the five or six most uh, influential people in terms of wartime policy. He was responsible, for example, in part, for the decision not to bomb the railways going to the concentration camps. He said, we have other bigger fish to fry. Maybe true. That was his call to make. So he really had a lot of authority. Uh, and one of the things he did as Assistant Secretary is look at uh, the situation after Pearl Harbor uh, and, along with Lieutenant General John DeWitt, who's the commandant of the Army on the West Coast, decide that internment was the most appropriate policy. It didn't start out necessarily with internment, although it seems pretty clear now that that was what was thought of as the objective from the start. Uh, but initially, it was an evacuation. So people had to leave their homes, report to an evacuation center. There was also a curfew in place for a time so people couldn't be out in the streets. Those were the bases for the criminal prosecutions that occurred in these cases. So Fred Korematsu, for example, was someone who refused to evacuate when ordered. He was then criminally prosecuted for failing to comply with this order. It is that prosecution uh, and the resulting conviction that ended up before the Supreme Court. John McCloy had a problem then, which is how do you defend this case before the Supreme Court? How do you posture this litigation in a way that is going to be successful instead of making the U.S. look bad, which no one wanted in a wartime situation? One of the particular problems there was McCloy looked at the report, the initial report done by Lieutenant General DeWitt. You might expect that General DeWitt might say, to put the best possible case on this, this terrible policy, well, we, we wanted to try to do the right thing. We wanted to have individual due process hearings to assess the loyalty of each Japanese American, even though DeWitt knew that the Office of Naval Intelligence, which had been tasked with assessing the loyalty of Japanese Americans, had concluded that the vast majority were completely loyal, uh, and there's only a handful that might have been disloyal, uh, and the Navy said, we can deal with those folks uh, as in a particularized way as we deal with any lawbreakers. Right? So the whole policy was flawed from the start. That conclusion by the Office of Naval Intelligence, that evacuation and detention were not needed, never found its way into any of the briefs the government filed in this case. Uh, and that probably amounted to a violation of Rule 3.3 of the ABA model rules of professional conduct, which say you have to be candid with a tribunal. You can't make stuff up. You can't uh, do affirmative misrepresentations. You can't even omit things if the effect would be a misrepresentation. You have to be candid. The Office of Naval Intelligence conclusion that the vast majority of Japanese were loyal never found its way into the government briefs. But in addition, DeWitt said, well, we can't uh, do these due process hearings, not because of time. We have plenty of time, he said, if that's what we wanted to do. The trouble, he said, lies not with the issue of time, but with the character of Japanese Americans. That's where DeWitt took a, a detour into the kind of stereotypes that drove this policy from the start. He said, the trouble is, a handful of Japanese Americans may express disloyal sentiments. You don't have to worry that much about those. The folks you have to worry about are the folks who seem loyal, who do all the right things, right? They're loyal, they're thrifty, they're well known in their community for being respectable. Those are the folks you have to watch out for because they're part of, in big, big scare quotes, the inscrutable Japanese, right? That was the basic reason that DeWitt put forward to justify the internment. John McCloy, ever the smart lawyer, said, no, that's not going to play well. We can't have that in our final report. So what did McCloy do? He ordered that suppressed. That was taken out of the report, courtesy of one of McCloy's lieutenants, John Hall, who's also an important figure in Kim's book. Uh, 
So that amounted to not just the violation of a 3.3, but probably a 3.4. So we're getting kind of a smorgasbord of ethical rule violations here. 3.4 says you can't conceal or destroy evidence. Right? Evidence of what DeWitt actually thought about the reasons for the internment, the reasons that drove it for him, because he was the commanding general, those are vital and material to the case. That evidence was, in effect, destroyed or at least altered by John McCloy because he said that was not convenient. Talk a little bit more. Um, yeah, so I, I was, well, I should say, first of all, if you're looking for, for the historical truth here, I researched my novel very carefully. Um, so what I put in about the conduct of the litigation, what I put in about the struggles within the government and the interaction between the different government agencies involved is actually all as accurate as I could make it. But I should also probably refer you to my sources, um, only a couple of which, unfortunately, I mentioned in the author's note. I wish, in retrospect, that I'd made it, made it longer. But I do mention Peter Iron's book, Justice at War, which is, I think, the best source, really the definitive source for what was going on inside the government during the litigation of these cases. Um, and so I was, I was reading that, and I came across this, the story of the suppression of the initial version of the final report and the alteration of the final report. And I thought that was so compelling that I had to put that in. Um, there are some other things that the government does. Um, there's participation by the War Department in the drafting of amicus briefs on behalf of the Pacific states, which is in violation of, maybe you could tell me what rule. The it's parties are not supposed to participate Court. in I mean, the drafting of the amicus Supreme briefs. The Supreme Court will ask you, as you guys probably know, if you've done a, a brief before a federal court, it's routine to have a disclaimer that says the parties have not given you any cash assistance for filing this amicus brief and haven't uh, drafted the brief for you. Right? Because the Supreme Court says, we want friends of the court, not parties masquerading as friends of the court. That rule was turned on its head by the government in this case. So that's a very interesting episode. Um, then if you go on to the Korematsu case, um, so I was talking here just about the Hirabayashi case, which is about the legality of the, the curfew that's imposed on Japanese Americans. The Korematsu case is about the removal from the coast, the forced removal from the coast. Um, and in that case, even more sort of surprising and questionable things happen because in the Hirabayashi case, the Department of Justice is basically taking the position, we're not sure if there's a problem or not. So, you know, a curfew is a wise precautionary measure. But when they're talking about removal, they've got to say something stronger. And the War Department is pushing them to say something stronger. And the War Department gives them the altered version of General DeWitt's final report, which one, thanks to Jack McCloy, now says there wasn't enough time for individualized hearings, so we had to remove everyone but also as justification for the suspicion of disloyalty, makes some assertions about specific behavior that had been detected. So there are claims that there were signal lights to Japanese ships. There are claims that there were short of ship radio transmissions, that there was, in fact, active, uh, verified disloyal behavior by the Japanese American community. So the Department of Justice lawyers, of course, want to check this out. So they get other government agencies like the FCC and the FBI to try to verify these claims. And the FCC comes back and says, no, we looked into this allegation about the radio transmissions, and it's just wrong. It didn't happen. The Army radio transmitters, the Army radio uh, operators were incompetent. They were picking up Radio Tokyo and thinking it was in Oakland. There were, in fact, no such radio transmissions. So now, of Moreover, course... Moreover, the FCC says that they told General DeWitt about this before he even drafted his report. Right? And he still went ahead and included those loaded allegations in his document. So now, of course, there's a dilemma for the Justice Department lawyers. What do they do? They've got this report. It's the official position of the War Department. It reflects the views of the relevant military authorities. And it makes these claims that are very helpful to their case. On the other hand, They've got information from other government agencies saying that these claims are false. So what should they do? Well, there's a big struggle inside the Department of Justice about this. Um, and in part, I guess, the struggle is based on what people think about 
the removal and detention itself, because there are some people in the Department of Justice who are very strongly opposed to it, um, some of these lawyers. And in part, I think it has to do with what they think their duties are. So the title of the book is Allegiance. One of the things that it's trying to explore is the way in which duties conflict. And I think that that's a problem that arises particularly in these sort of hybrid cases. Um, so, you know, if you've got a straightforward war being fought on the battlefield, it's pretty clear who the enemy is and what your duties are, and they are just the enemy. But if you have a situation where war and the civil justice system collide, which is what sort of happens in Korematsu, he's being prosecuted um, for violating a federal statute, not for violating the laws of war or anything like that. Or you have a situation where it's unclear who the enemy is and you're dealing with American citizens who, of course, have constitutional rights. You get these difficult conflicts between duties. So in the Justice Department, the lawyers are asking themselves, you know, do we represent the War Department? Are we trying to put the best face on that? Or do we represent the president? Are we trying to do what the president wants? And in fact, it seems that the president is driven in some cases by political considerations rather than national security considerations. Um, do we represent the United States as a whole? Should we be thinking about the interests of the country? Do we represent the Constitution? You know, should we be trying to get the legally resu correct result here? So all of these conflicting ideas about what, what their duties are, um, and it turns into a very dramatic fight about a footnote in a Supreme Court brief, which I thought was really exciting. Um, I ended up actually shortening it a little bit in the book because not everyone thinks that fighting over footnotes in Supreme Court briefs is that exciting. But there is really a remarkable back and forth, and they're printing the brief, and it gets stopped. The printers get stopped several times, and the footnote gets revised. Because, because some of the justices, uh, or some of the Justice Department lawyers, rather, uh, including Edward Ennis, who was also figures in Kim's book, uh, who is a fundamentally decent guy, a superb lawyer, who found himself defending a policy he really could not defend. He said, one of the things we need to do, we really ought to do, as people believe in the rule of law, is to state clearly that the DeWitt report is false in material respects, right? So that way everyone will understand that, you know, what we are relying on here is, is not really be relied on, certainly not in whole, and maybe not even in, in, per, in part. Well, that was the, the kind of stance that Ennis wanted to take here, but that led to some pushback from McCloy at the War Department. Yeah, so um, John Burling, who's drafting the Korematsu briefs, um, he gets mentioned, but basically actually his, his role is taken over by my main character. So my main character ends up being the Department of Justice lawyer who's drafting these briefs, wants to put in a footnote that says, here's the final report, but you should know that certain claims in it are in conflict with information in the possession of the Department of Justice. And that's the footnote that he drafts, but of course, the War Department objects, they want the footnote taken out, they don't want the Department of Justice to say anything that casts doubt on the final report. And eventually, they come up with a compromise that's brokered by Herbert Wexler. Do you want to say a little bit about sure. so Herbert Wexler? So Herbert Wexler is kind of the, the bookend here. I mentioned this is a tale of two lawyers. One was John McCloy, the other is Wexler. Wexler was one of the preeminent constitutional lawyers of the 20th century. Uh, but that's not all he did. In addition to constitutional law, where he, he showed his skills by arguing for the New York Times in the famous libel case, New York Times versus Sullivan. In addition to that, he also drafted the model penal code. So he had an overwhelming influence on the development of criminal law in the United States in the 20th century. Plus, he, along with Henry Hart of Harvard, practically invented the field of federal courts and wrote the preeminent casebook on federal courts. Right? So he was a, a vital figure. He also was a, a colleague uh, at Columbia Law School of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, sometimes known as the notorious RBG. Uh, and Justice Ginsburg mentioned Wexler at a debate she had in the last year or so with the late Justice Scalia. Uh, so she fondly remembered him as a colleague. He actually uh, helped teach me federal courts at Columbia. Uh, at that point, he was at least 70. Uh, and he'd perhaps slowed down a little bit. 
uh, but he still was a person of incisive intelligence. He was relied on by Attorney General Francis Biddle in the same way that McCloy was relied on by Secretary of War Henry Stimson. Right? So he was really a key player in the Justice Department strategy. And he brokered this footnote in a way that we'll just now describe. Yes. So Wexler comes up with what is supposed to be a compromise footnote, which says to the Supreme Court, basically, here is General DeWitt's final report. We are asserting as fact only those claims that we specifically repeat. So here's the report, sort of make of it what you may. We stand behind everything we repeat in our briefs, and we're not necessarily standing behind the rest, um, is the implication. Well, this is the way it, it read. Let me just sort of, just for the sake of, because we're all lawyers, try to look at it verbatim, right? So he said, we recite facts in this brief regarding the justification for the mass evacuation of Japanese Americans. We rely on the report by General DeWitt only as it regards the justification for the evacuation. So that's the way the footnote is phrased, only for justifications of the evacuation. So then, of course, the Justice Department lawyers are hoping that the Supreme Court will pick up on this and view the, report, the final report skeptically. Um, and some people have actually seen it that way. So Justice Breyer, in his recent book, The Court and the World, says, well, this is a footnote that was a red flag for any you know, person who was not brain dead, that there was a problem with the Justice Department's brief and in particular with the DeWitt report. Yes, and I think, I think it is a red flag. Um, I mean, the only question is, if we're talking about the role of Herbert Wexler, he made it less of a red flag than it was initially. Much less. So I tend, I tend not to view Herbert Wexler's participation all that favorably. Um, but then what happens, um, and I have to confess here, I'm not entirely sure that this did happen. It happens in my book. Um, and I, I think that I changed very little. So I know that this is based in fact. Um, but what I believe happens then is the Justice Department lawyers who are secretly hoping, or not so secretly hoping because they, they tell their superiors, but they're hoping that the government is going to lose this case. They think that the government should lose. And they're sort of doing their duty um, as government lawyers and writing the briefs as best they can, but they also think of the correct outcome here is we should lose. And we should lose in part because there are these false claims in the final report. So they actually, and this is a breach of their ethical obligations, they actually go and consult with the counsel for Fred Korematsu, a Philadelphia lawyer named Charles Horsky. And they suggest to him in the oral argument, you can mention this footnote. You can attack the final report, because the Department of Justice is not going to stand behind it if you go after these specific claims. Unfortunately, and this is true because I read the transcript carefully, um, in the oral argument, Horsky does that, and Solicitor General Charles Fahey, for reasons that no one is fully sure of, then defends it. He says, yes, we do. We stand entirely behind the final report. So the end result in the oral argument is, regardless of what the footnote says, the justices get a full-throated defense of the final report from the Solicitor General of the United States. And that was really hardwired into this result by the equivocal nature of the footnote itself. The Justice Department could have done what John Burling recommended and very straightforwardly said, this report is gravely flawed. Thanks to Wexler, a very artful drafter, they didn't do that. And in fact, you could read the footnote because it said we rely on the report to supply justifications for the mass evacuation. You could read that footnote as supplying uh, a justification that would include the spurious claims of signaling that DeWitt made, claims that the FCC had itself repudiated. Uh, and since the report was widely available, there's nothing to stop the justices from reading it in its entirety and draw the conclusion that it was basically right as to all respects, uh, instead of drawing the inference that false in one, false in all, right, that because the signaling story was completely wrong, that the rest of the report was garbage as well, which would have been the right way to view it. So what does the Supreme Court do? Well, the justices and the court as an institution also seem a little bit conflicted. Um, and in part, you can see that because when they do uphold the removal in Korematsu, um, it's a 6-3 decision. And there are some pretty bitter dissents. There's Justice Jackson's famous dissent, 
where he says, this case lies about like a loaded gun, ready for the next potential tyrant to wield it. Um, although interestingly, Korematsu has actually functioned in basically the opposite way. Um, just a brief digression. If you ask what the significance of Korematsu historically is, I think it's pretty clear that the Supreme Court looks back on that and says, wait a second, you know, the executive branch overstated its case in the name of national security. We were too credulous, and we're going to be more skeptical in the future. And I think you see that in some of the post-9-11 litigation. But um, what happens in the World War II era? Korematsu is a, a split decision. It's 6-3. And the court also sort of chops things up, splits the issues a little bit more, because all along, the Japanese Americans and the lawyers for the Japanese Americans have been trying to make detention the issue, because obviously that's the hardest thing for the government to defend. So even in the Hirabayashi case, they're trying to raise detention. And the court says, no, no, we're just considering the curfew. In the Korematsu case, where you would think it's actually much harder to avoid, they again say, we're challenging detention. And the court says, no, no, we're just considering the forced removal from the West Coast. When the court finally has to consider detention, it gets to it in the case of Mitsuya Endo, ex parte Endo, it does not uphold it. So probably you all know this, but there's sort of a conventional wisdom out there that in Korematsu, the Supreme Court upheld the incarceration of Japanese Americans, which is not true. It's, I mean, it's, it's wrong in two respects. One, Korematsu didn't consider the detention. And two, when it got to the detention, the Supreme Court actually said, if you don't have some individualized, particularized reason to doubt the loyalty of some person, you actually have to release them. Now, interestingly, they didn't say this on constitutional grounds, which would have been a sort of nice, resounding counterpoint to Korematsu. Um, Instead, they said detention was not authorized. Detention of loyal Americans was never part of the plan, um, which is not very realistic, because obviously the government knew what was going on. Congress had appropriated funds for it. But that's what the Supreme Court said, which I take as indicating its discomfort with the program in general and more particularly approving the detention of American citizens. So. The court is uncomfortable. The government has done some questionable things. In the end, all of this comes out um, because of scholars like Peter Irons. And in the 1980s, there's litigation about it. There are quorum nobis cases brought to set aside the convictions of Fred Korematsu and others. And in fact, Fred Korematsu does get his conviction set aside on the grounds that there was misconduct by the Solicitor General's office. So you mentioned the 9-11 era. Do you think that the legal profession and courts have learned the right lessons from Korematsu? Well, it's hard to say what the right lessons are. You know, I mean, so one of the things I was trying to say at first was, why did the removal and detention happen? And the answer there is, it was a terrible mistake, and there were bad forces at work, and there was a general indifference to the welfare of the Japanese Americans that made other people not stand up and protest. Um, and it was a terrible mistake, and it never should have happened. Then there's the question, why did the Korematsu case come out the way it did? Why did the court not intervene and stop this? And you know, that's a harder question, I think, what went wrong there, and the easy out is to say it's the fault of the Department of Justice and the executive branch because they lied to the Supreme Court. And if the Supreme Court had known the truth, then they never would have let this happen. Um, but I think maybe that's letting the justices off too easily. And I try to suggest that in my book, too, because Frank Murphy writes a dissent that pretty squarely and pretty convincingly takes on the justifications that the government offers, um, in particular the claim that there wasn't enough time to do individualized hearings because he points out it was six months before people were actually sent to the relocation centers. There was plenty of time, and he takes on you know, the various racially tinged arguments for generalized suspicion. Um, so you know, many people think, actually, if the court had been willing to look clearly at the evidence, it would have been relatively clear to them what was going on, despite the fact that the Justice Department was not as forthright as they could have been. So you should blame the court. Um, and then you have the, the problem that, you know, 
in time of war, when the government is making claims of military necessity, they do rest on expertise that judges don't have. So it's very awkward to have civilian courts second-guessing military authorities and how to resolve that kind of problem, which I think is sort of the essence of this, this hybrid threat dilemma, is a very hard problem in constitutional law. Um, and it's possible, you know, that you can say there's some issue here where you shouldn't be deferring, where judges shouldn't be deferring because, sure, the military knows about, you know, what the threats are, although the claim that there was a real threat of a Japanese invasion landing on the West Coast is actually very overstated. Um, but maybe you shouldn't defer to their sociological judgment that racial identity is a good proxy for disloyalty. Because in this litigation, there are actually plenty of briefs from sociologists saying that's not the case. The Japanese American community is quite loyal. But it's a difficult problem um, how you can have courts trying to uphold constitutional values in the civilian justice system where they're coming into conflict with military orders and military expertise. So in Hamdi, Justice O'Connor famously said that the executive doesn't get a blank check. So, and, and Justice O'Connor said the executive might say everyone at uh, Gitmo, or in, in Hamdi's case, he's an American citizen detained in a brig in South Carolina, he should be detained, just trust us. Uh, basically, there's no judicial review that is necessary or that is appropriate. Justice O'Connor replied, but you could have false positives. You could have mistakes. So someone like Hamdi who might be picked up in Afghanistan could possibly be just a mere student or an aid worker or a journalist. You can't be absolutely sure without this antidote to bias that you get from really robust judicial review. So Justice O'Connor seemed to be willing to kind of dive in and at least not wholly take the military's word for it. Do you think that's a a constructive development in the wake of Korematsu? Yeah, I think I do. I mean, I, I think on the whole, the Supreme Court has taken the right lesson from this, which is greater skepticism. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's a dangerous tendency, um, and this is one of the things that people seem to be feeling in the World War II era, that, you know, when we're at war, Felix Frankfurter says this, in time of war, there's only one rule, form your battalion and fight. Um, there's a natural tendency for people to come together and think, you know, loyal Americans will all stand up for the government and support what it's doing. Um, sometimes the government does make mistakes, and some degree of skepticism, I think, is probably warranted. Um, you know, it's going to vary depending on the precise factual circumstances. What lessons can we draw about lawyers? So, for example, uh, in one of the other post-9-11 cases, the Padilla case, Paul Clement, who was then, I think, acting solicitor general, argued the case. This is in spring of 2004. He was asked about whether there were ever abuses of detainees. Uh, and he said, the government doesn't abuse people. It doesn't engage in torture. That very night, the first photos of Abu Ghraib were released. I don't think Paul Clement actually knew about the abuse at Abu Ghraib. Uh, but it did create a, a kind of odd disjunction between what he'd said at the court and the evidence that everyone saw on their TV or on the web that evening. And we also had John Yu, uh, chasing to say, as a law professor, who was at the Justice Department, drafted the torture memos there, where John Yu said, waterboarding is not torture. Uh, one of Yu's arguments was that uh, it can't possibly be torture because torture requires specific intent. That is, you have to get your jollies from inflicting severe pain on someone. Otherwise, it's not really torture. If you do it for some other reason, like getting information, you don't have the requisite specific intent under the statute. And that would mean, to hark back to what my father experienced, that if, if the Nazis were interrogating you and they said, if we have faces making you talk, the Nazis wouldn't be engaging in torture because they wanted some information. Right? So that's John Yu's experience. Now, John Yu was not subject to professional discipline. Uh, he was never prosecuted. He's never been successfully sued in a US courtroom. Should we have more robust remedies for uh, a lawyer engaged in conduct like that? Um, 
Yes, I think we should, is the short answer. But I, I mean, uh, I'd like to say something about Padilla. I'd like to say something about you also. Not you, but John Yu. Because um, John Yu, I think, is actually a good illustration of the general point, um, the general way that I think about this, which is it's very awkward to have civilian judges second guessing military and intelligence experts. And to some extent, I think they have to do it. To some extent, I think they should be skeptical in the way that Justice O'Connor was. But the best thing would be for the terrible, unnecessary civil rights violations never to happen. So the executive branch is really the first line of defense here. And I think it's very important to have good, scrupulous, ethical lawyers in the executive branch. And John, you. Some of what he said about executive power, I do think he sincerely believed, and it wasn't motivated by the particular situation in which he found himself. The stuff about specific intent is, is pretty crazy. I mean, I find it hard to believe that there he was providing his best neutral legal opinion rather than trying to find a justification for what the client wanted. And that's not really supposed to be the role of the Office of Legal Counsel, right? The Office of Legal Counsel is supposed to tell the executive branch, what they can and can't do. Not view it as the client and you're supposed to come up with the most persuasive theory you can to justify what the client wants to do. Um, so that's something about the role of executive lawyers. Something about the role of um, other lawyers, which I just remembered about the Padilla case. And I, I mention this because I always like to tell it to my law students. So for all of the law students in the audience, in the Padilla case, of course, the government wants to hold Jose Padilla and interrogate him and not give him access to a lawyer. And the judge in this case asks why, right? Why do you need to keep him without letting him see a lawyer? And in response, the government submits a declaration from Vice Admiral Lowell Jacoby, um, who says, successful interrogation requires the creation of a relationship of trust and dependence between the detainee and the interrogator. And introducing a lawyer into that relationship disrupts it. And it disrupts it, they actually say, because it gives the detainee hope. It gives the detainee hope that he may obtain release through legal process. So he doesn't feel like he's totally at the mercy of the interrogator. And so I always like to tell my students, you will go out and be lawyers, and you will bring people hope. Um, but I had a chance to talk to John Yu about this actually once at a, an event at the National Constitution Center, which was only briefly disrupted by protesters in their orange jumpsuits. Um, and I said to him, I don't understand why you can't let this guy see a lawyer and give him a hearing first. And if you've got the evidence and he's really a bad guy and you convince the judge, then he knows he has no hope. And you can interrogate him and you know, treat him the way he deserves. But why do you do this before he gets any kind of a hearing? Um, and I can't remember what his answer was. But whatever it was, I, I didn't find it very satisfying. I mean, the thing, about, the thing about John Yu, and I have a character in this book who's supposed to resemble him, is that he's very difficult to interrogate, I was going to say. He's very difficult to interview or to challenge because He's always very calm, and he's smiling, and he says everything in a very mild tone. And I was trying to get him to repeat some of the inflammatory things that he'd said, but he, he wasn't really willing to do it. So I think he just said something anodyne about, you know, this is what studies have shown is the most effective technique, or something like that. But I am a fan of some kind of um, judicial, or at least relatively neutral, involvement in terms of verification of the factual basis for detention. And I think if you do that at an early stage, then you can get interrogation afterwards once there's some demonstration that these are, in fact, the right people. But the problem that we had in a lot of these cases was in just about every situation where the government is required to show its evidence, it happened with Hamdi, it happened with Padilla, it turns out that they're not willing to do that. So do they actually have any evidence? We don't know with Hamdi, right? They fold. They say, we're not going to try to demonstrate that he is, in fact, who we say he is. We're going to release him on the condition that he renounces US citizenship and promise not to sue us. Exactly. And they actually, the government tried to moot out the Endo case, but couldn't do that. Endo was very persistent. That's why we have this ruling that says that 
the president lacks statutory, although not constitutional, but statutory authority to detain people who are conceitedly loyal, which everyone admitted was the case for Mitsui Endo. We have about uh, five minutes or so for questions. Yeah. Uh, we, we do, actually, maybe a little bit, a few minutes more than that. Um, let me, let me throw one out. Uh, during World War II, we had about 400,000 German prisoners of war in the United States. Um, should we have, and this is before the Geneva Conventions that set forth, should they have had due process rights? Should they have gotten lawyers? That sort of thing. What do you think? Um, I love that question. Because um, people always do say, well, you know, due process, due process of war, isn't that an oxymoron, isn't it impossible to say that um, enemy combatants should have due process rights? And my answer is, I think, I think they do have due process rights. And here's why. Um, I think that everyone everywhere basically has due process rights. But I also think that due process is a flexible and context-dependent concept, so that it requires different things in different circumstances. And if you're fighting a war against an enemy in uniform, they have due process rights, but you can still shoot them dead on the battlefield. And my evidence for this is the Civil War, right, where we were fighting against American citizens on American soil. They certainly had due process rights. No one denied that. But it was still constitutionally acceptable to shoot them dead on the battlefield. So you can say that these people have due process rights, which I would say, and also say that doesn't mean they get a hearing. That doesn't mean they get a lawyer. The difference and now I'm, I'm remembering more of my conversation with John Yu, because I, I did say this to him, because he was bringing up the example of German prisoners of war, is in World War II with German prisoners of war, there's a very large number of them, and there's really no doubt about their status. So very difficult to give them hearings and probably wouldn't gain anything by it. If you're talking about a small number of people and there is real doubt about their status. Did they, in fact, do the things they're alleged to have done? Are they enemy combatants or are they you know, aid workers turned over for bounties? Um, then it's much more feasible and you gain much more in terms of enhancing the accuracy. So the short answer is due process rights, yes. Lawyers for German POWs, no, I don't think so. What should the lawyers have done uh, during World War II, meaning uh, assuming within the system they weren't going to get any, should they have gone to the press? Should they have taken some documents and given them to the New York Times or something like that during, during uh, the war? Well, that would have been a violation of their duty of confidentiality, which is now Rule 1.6. But that's a, an excellent question to ask. There is at least some evidence that in the post-9-11 era, some military lawyers who just couldn't stomach the interrogation policies that have been approved by folks like John Yu may have done just that, gone to the press and said, we just can't put up with this. It's against everything we are taught as military lawyers for amongst other reasons that we don't want our guys subject to this kind of treatment when they are captured. Uh, and although that technically would have violated the rules, there, there's an argument in a case where the stakes are that high that maybe it is a vindication of a higher good when people disclose that information. And I do think the public was greatly served by knowing in 2004 about what was being done in our name. So if, in fact, military lawyers were involved, and I can't say that for sure, but if that were true, uh, I, I would actually view that favorably uh, in terms of trying to get us to live up to our, our best ideals in a constitutional republic. One other question, and this came up earlier, who really is the client? Uh, and because you know in the, in the UK case that the OLC uh, rules at that time did talk about that you're supposed to take into account the president's, you know, agenda or some, words, words to that effect. Who, who is the client? Is it, you know, what the lawyer thinks the American people want? or what the lawyer is tasked to do? I, I think in conventional cases, in, in what uh, uh, Kuhn, the philosopher of science, would say is, is normal science, then the client is your agency, whoever you happen to work for. Right? And I think there's generally a benefit from subordinating your views to the views of your client, taking your client's direction, 
as there is for any lawyer. Uh, I think it gets tougher in, in big cases uh, when you are representing the United States before the Supreme Court, for example, as Solicitor General. I think you have to consider more what is in the, in the best interests of the constitutional position of the United States government, which is a repeat player in the Supreme Court, right, which can't afford to lose its credibility before that vital tribunal. Right? Kurt, do, you, do you have a view on that one? Well, my view is that you know there are lots of different kinds of lawyers in different circumstances, and so I, I don't think there's an answer that would work for all situations. Um, one thing that that I did notice repeatedly in the historical episodes that I was researching, though, and this sort of relates to the higher good um, argument that um, Peter was mentioning, which is um, military lawyers over and over again do a, just an outstanding job for the people that they're assigned to defend. And they do this often to the consternation of the civilian administrative administration people um, who assign them because um, civilians in the administration think, of course, we're going to give these bad guys lawyers, but you know they're military lawyers and they know what side they're on, and of course, you know we know how the case is going to come out. And um, over and over again, they're astonished by what a vigorous and effective defense the military lawyers put on. Um, and you might ask there, right, who's the client? Because the government is thinking, you know, you work for the U.S. government; these are bad guys; they're our enemies. You know, you're not really going to defend them. Um, but the lawyers do. And, and why is that? I think in part it's because you know, that's their duty and that's the client that they're assigned and they zealously represent the interests of their client. But also I think it's because they're, they're thinking of the Constitution um, and they're defending the Constitution. Um, in a lot of cases, I think it's possible to say, so the challenge that the defense lawyers of all kinds frequently get is how can you defend such terrible people? And I think in many cases the answer to that is I'm not defending this individual, I'm defending his or her rights. And those rights are your rights too. Those rights are the rights that we all have. And what I'm defending really is the Constitution. So in that sense you could almost say sometimes the client is the Constitution. During the time of enhanced interrogation in the building. And Peter, yes, there were rumors around that, that military lawyers had gone and, and revealed some things that perhaps they shouldn't have revealed. That's never really been definitively discussed and, and proven, and, and it may possibly have been uh, attorneys who were in, in reserve capacities but went in their private capacities. But I would just add, for the sake of the younger judge advocates in the audience, that this was, in fact, one of the finest hours of our respective JAG Corps. Uh, because the TJAGs, as a collective group, um, sent a memo to the Secretary of Defense saying, these things are wrong, we will not stand for these things, and we will not support these things. And so I think younger judge advocates need to put that in his historical perspective, okay? And I, I think we'll, we'll end with that. I, I just add one footnote. I think with hindsight, it seems like, of course, the military JAGs would do that. At the time, you got to remember what it was like in 2002-2003 time frame when uh, there were, I think, in Atlantic Magazine, there was even an article at that time that was kind of touting torture. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a very different time. And so I think what's great about the legal profession, and I think what people depend upon us to do is to be the, you know, the one person in the room that says, wait a minute. And, you might, and there's a certain expectation of other people because of this profession that they will be that person of all the people in the room, especially in the military, because military basically has a can-do attitude, that the lawyer and particularly judge advocates will be the one person to say, wait a minute. And it may be that, you know, people will say, thank you for your interest in national defense. But the fact of the matter is, you got to get up every day and you got to look yourself in the eye. And so you have to make some hard decisions. And one of the things I, I tell my students is, you always have to have plan B. Because not all the time are you going to be vindicated. You may have to do something 
that is going to be very, very costly. And even though you're right, there's going to be a price paid. This was really, I, I, I've gotten a lot of ethics things, but what, what a great way to present a number of issues. Thank you so much. Tomorrow, uh, a scheme of attack is 8 a.m. for uh, the Continental Breakfast, and we'll start at 8, 8.30. A uh, couple changes there, obviously. You can park in the law school lot. Just so you know where that is, that's where we are now. And